this is the Coming Home Podcast with John Allen. Three, two, one, and welcome everybody to this episode of Coming Home with John Allen. I am your host, John Allen. Before we get started, I want to let you all know that I really appreciate your viewership and your listenership. Uh, If you're listening to this on a podcast platform, just be aware that you can go to my YouTube channel if you would like to watch the video version. Then you can see how cute everybody is. Now, having said that, this episode is a little bit different. Um, One of my guests for today's episode uh, did not have the capability of having themselves filmed. Both of them were out of my studio. Um, My original intention was to film myself from my studio, but I had some lighting issues. So for this episode on my YouTube channel, you're only going to get a still image and I'll paste in some portrait photographs of my two guests and of myself. Here we go with this episode. This is part two of a conversation I'm having with my two guests, Keith Redmond and John Richardson. Here we go. And here we are. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here for this episode of Coming Home with John Allen. I'm your host, John Allen. And this is a continuation of a prior conversation I had with Keith Redmond and John Richardson. I'm going to start off with uh, one question, uh, and I have two more. I would like both of you, if you would, please, to opine on the questions that I present. The first one I'd like to put out there is, why do Americans living abroad, renounce their citizenship? And, you know, what are the reasons for that? And what should they consider in that process? Keith, if you would, please. Sure. Well, it's certainly a very broad question. um, And there's a number of factors to consider before one renounces one's U.S. citizenship. I would say it's definitely applicable for the American emigrant, and that's with an E, the uh, permanent American overseas who is not looking to ever live back in the United States again. And the challenge is is that with citizenship-based taxation, um, managing two incongruent tax systems can be problematic. And again, it's based on one's profile, but as one moves forward in their life outside the United States and starts to accumulate wealth, and what I mean by wealth is starts to invest, save for retirement, buy a house, get married, etc. It comes to a point where one is not able to live a normal life like anybody else in their resident country. And in fact, they are quite inhibited um, dealing with not only their resident country's tax system, but the U.S. tax system. And the problem is, is that with the U.S. tax system, it's almost like there's two separate tax systems. One that is extremely punitive for Americans living overseas. And it becomes um, a major challenge to be able to do any type of investing and saving for retirement. That's point number one. Point number two is there is in, in many countries a problem with a problem, which is FATCA, which is not the problem, which is citizenship-based taxation, but a problem that's associated with it is FATCA. And in many countries, Americans overseas are persona non grata, where they are being refused not only basic checking and savings accounts, but being refused mortgages, investments, et cetera, at, because they have U.S. citizenship. And so... Wow. Wow. By renouncing and obtaining one's CLN, Certificate of Loss and Nationality, they are able to ironically live in freedom to be able to have a normal life in their respective countries of residence. And the last point is that each person needs to consider very carefully what that's going to look like moving forward. They would have to come to the decision that Their life is outside the United States. They don't plan on moving back to the United States um, to uh, live or work. Or conduct business. It's a multifaceted approach to really taking a look at whether one renounces or not. Now, is 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 it uh, is it like a monkey wrench being thrown into the works? If because you mentioned if uh, people are going to go back there to live their life or to work, but is it? 
Is it different or more difficult or less difficult if one is still living abroad but is doing business in the United States, real estate investments, um, you know, what, whatever, some sort of LLC corporation that they're running that does business in the States but they're living overseas? What, what does that mean? Well, I would on that particular question, I would defer to John on that okay. one because he's more the he has more the expertise in that particular area to answer appropriately. Okay, John, if you would please, um, let me repeat the question: Why renounce citizenship, and what are the considerations that one must be aware of in that process? And then, if you want to fill out about uh, what I said, if someone is running business uh, in the United States while they're an American citizen living overseas. Go ahead, John. Okay. Well, uh, why would anybody uh, renounce any citizenship? Um, there's absolutely no reason to ever renounce any citizenship unless it's causing you pain, problem, and disability. And what has happened is that although the vast majority of U.S. citizens do not owe any U.S. tax, they are subject to a complex tax and regulatory regime that basically denies them all of the uh, retirement and tax planning benefits of their country of residence if they're living there long term, right? So, for example, and there are many variants on this, okay, but let's imagine that uh, you're living uh, in a country it's like Australia where you have the superannuation, which is a mandated, uh, required a program to participate in, and uh, basically it's designed to benefit people under the Australian tax system, but there's a lot of confusion in how the U.S. tax system applies to it, but the consensus is that there's a very, very real chance that the U.S. tax rules as they apply to Americans abroad would simply strip away all the benefits that somebody like that would get uh, living in Australia. Okay. And one of the one of the problems with the discussion is here that people talk about taxation, and this is not about taxation. In fact, taxation is no longer even about taxation. A tax mm -hmm. systems are a comprehensive regulatory means to incentivize retirement planning. Sure, it includes tax, you know, where people have to pay tax to the government, etc. But it's a reward certain uh, and encourage certain financial behavior and punish others. Now, the basic problem is put it very, very simply, is that the U.S. tax system is deliberately, willfully, consciously designed to punish anything that is foreign to the United States, and that obviously includes all the benefits that Americans abroad would get under the tax system where they live. So the reason they renounce is so that they are able to have the benefits of being literally allowed to responsibly plan for their retirement, for their families, et cetera. Now, you ask, well, uh, so, so I mean, who should renounce? Well, I mean, obviously, uh, the people who are most affected by this, and I wanna be very, very clear, the people who are affected by this are the people who make an effort to comply with the US tax system, right? Not the ones who don't, but the ones who are. That's an interesting point. So, so what's happening is that these U.S. rules are forcing, and yes, I'm using that word deliberately, and I will repeat it, forcing those who wish to apply, who comply with the U.S. laws to abandon their U.S. citizenship so that they are basically, uh, you know, free, able to live the kinds of lives that they are required to live in the modern world. That is to take responsibility for their lives. Now, things to look out for. I mean, we're, we're it really all that simple, you know, that <laughs> your problems would be solved by renouncing. They're not necessarily. For somebody who has, because when you renounce or when you consider renunciation, the first question you need to ask is, what will my financial relationship be with the United States after I renounce? Okay. Yeah. And there's a huge difference, and that includes assets. It includes sources of income. Now, there's a huge difference between Americans abroad who have substantial U.S. assets and those and substantial U.S. income streams and those who don't. Because by renouncing from a tax perspective, you become what's called a non-resident alien. And non-resident aliens, the U.S. doesn't have one tax system. It has six, seven tax systems, okay? 
Okay. You know, the tax system that applies to Americans abroad is totally different from the tax system that applies to resident Americans. The tax system that applies to non-resident aliens, and that's who you become after you renounce, is totally different from the tax system that applies to resident Americans. All right, et cetera. So you have to see how, if you have U.S. income streams and U.S. assets, you will continue to have to interact with the U.S. tax system. What that means, it will change your status. And this, by the way, is why uh, a number of what I would call retirees abroad do not want to end citizenship taxation because they're afraid that they'll be treated as non-resident aliens and possibly okay. subjected to a more punitive tax system. Uh, I would add also, uh, you know, we look at uh, income streams, we look at assets, you need to look at the quantum of assets that you have in the United States because the United States imposes, uh, I mean, you think the income tax regime is vicious. There's nothing like the estate, the estate tax regime as it applies to assets owned by non-resident aliens where they have an exemption of only $60,000 and anything above that is possibly subject to literally a 40% confiscation, yeah, yeah. you know, if it's not held properly. So, I right. mean, you know, you get the impression from, you know, these groups out there that somehow, you know, this is some simple thing and it's just a question of do you want to be an American or not? And nothing and nothing really could be further from the truth. Now, if you, you know, to get to your, um, you know, your, your follow-up question, uh, which I think was, uh, can you run a business from outside the U.S. as a non-U.S. citizen or, or something yeah, like that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can do that. Um you know, again, uh, you're doing it as a non-resident alien, uh, so you have to look at both the domestic tax rules for how that's done, but you also have to look at the treaty that might apply. Now, I want to talk about treaties in general, and we'll start here. The, the treaty, many treaties, and the treaties are different, okay, would impose taxation on the business, all right, if uh, the person had a permanent establishment in the U.S. And I, you know, I don't want to get into the details here, but only to point out you know, that although this is possible, I mean, you know, you have to navigate a certain uh, regulatory regime to do that. And the final point I would make here, and I probably should stop because I can go on <laughs> for a week with your question, but I think the final point that I absolutely want to make is this, all right? And this is, you never see this discussed anywhere. None of the accounting firms, none of the law firms, but this is very real, okay? The U.S. has tax treaties with a number of countries, and... It is amazing how many of those tax treaties have provisions that are dependent on somebody being a citizen or not being a citizen, okay? Yeah. So, for example, if you believe that you are going to inherit a lot of assets from the United States, now you're living in another country, and that country might have an inheritance tax, right? Yeah. It might have an inheritance tax, and there are certain tax treaties that may exempt U.S. citizens from the inheritance tax on assets inherited from America. So, you know, I'm going to stop. I could go on and on. But unless you have absolutely nothing, no assets, no connection to the United States, you're going to need some help with this. It's quite the complex thing, and that kind of leads into what is actually going to be the last question. So I'll, I'll get to that. Um, but before that question, Keith, if you would, please, um, accidental Americans, who are they? What, what, what does that term mean? Who are they and what is their plight? Well, it's an interesting term because that term did not exist no. prior to the implementation of FATCA. And I guess I should say what FATCA is. It's the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act that was passed in 2010 with the Higher Act. And in the subsequent few years after that was implemented in the various countries around the world. And as a result of that particular uh, law implemented, there has been this population that's been uncovered called accidental Americans. And I'll give you the classic example of what an accidental American is. Take a, a French guy. He's born in the United States to French parents. His French parents were there studying, working, whatever. Yeah. He was born on U.S. soil. Therefore, he's automatically a U.S. citizen. 
He's also French because of his French parents. Yeah. yeah. They move. They move to the back. They move to France with the baby, and that baby is raised in France, educated in France, and works in France, and oftentimes does not speak English, does not even have a U.S. passport or a social security number. No Fast ties. Forward. No ties to the USA whatsoever. Never except worked. their. Except, Except for their being place born of there. birth. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so fa let's say fast forward 30 years. They get a letter from their bank because of the FATCA regime stating that they have been identified as a U.S. person because of a U.S. place of birth. And they need to uh, either submit a Social Security number or a certificate of loss of nationality, which one gets when one green outs. Otherwise, their bank accounts will be on hold or will be closed. Well... They had no idea. So they are deemed a U.S. person as a result. And then they find out that they should have been filing U.S. tax declarations yeah. ever since they started working. Because that's what the expectation is. Even if they left in diapers yeah. in the United States, they are expected to do so. So they are one of a number of populations adversely affected by this. But in my opinion, this is, for me, such an egregious yes. result of the U.S. tax system. Yeah, yeah, because the plight is quite uh, all-encompassing. The, the plight that they're in is quite uh, damaging and, and restrictive and, and, and life-crippling. Because uh, you said it yourself, they, they could meet a situation where their bank freezes their accounts. Uh, uh, there, there could be a drastic and detrimental change to their mortgage status for their home. Uh, things can happen with their personal credit. Uh, they may not be able to build any credit. Um, can you exactly. Talk? So yeah. there, it's a bit, a bit of a Kafka-esque situation yeah. that they're in. And, and I've, I've worked with many over the years. I know some who have just decided to bite the bullet and try to get a social security number just to satisfy their bank and that's it. They yeah. move forward, and there's others who have decided to do a, a self-certification that they're not a U.S. person, but you need to have a professional help you with something like that. Yeah. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And then others decide to uh, go through the renunciation process to rid themselves of this forced U.S. citizenship, which in turn, it's not a big deal, but because the way the U.S. links it's citizenship with tax residency. Yeah. It's a major problem. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, John, can you fill in any holes on that? Um, I think I would broaden the definition of accidental American. Uh, I think of an accidental American as um, any uh, person with U.S. citizenship by birth, who moved from the United States uh, before, uh, you know, getting any kind of financial footprint at all in the United States or possibly even being in a position to file U.S. tax returns. So I would include, uh, you know, I would include people right up into their early 20s, you know, or for whatever reason, you know, went abroad to teach English, you know, in state or something like that. And I don't. I think the you know the phrase that I always hear, "who left in diapers," is is far too restrictive. Well, that's just the classic uh, definition I wanted to say, but you yeah, certainly well, have. Well, it's the one I always hear. It's yeah, it yeah. is. A, it's a classic, but it's very narrow. Stop um, being stop being so narrow, Keith. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, why should I mean? What's the difference between you know somebody who you know, left when they were a year old, I mean, you know, it makes it sound like it's even more egregious. What's the difference between that person and somebody whose family moved as a teenager to Europe forever? Well, you know what, John, you raise a good point, and I think it also lends itself also to, let's say, an individual who's born to uh, an American parent outside the United States, and that American parent qualifies to transmit their citizenship to that child. And so that child can be considered an accidental American as well. I think agree? that child clearly would be considered yeah. an accidental. I mean, they, they don't even have to leave in diapers, okay? Right. Uh, I'm thinking, though, regardless of the, the the exact definition or the nuances within that definition, it's it's such a horrible thing to have happen to get that phone call or that letter from your bank telling you that your life is basically on hold. Everything is disrupted now. What an awful thing to have happen. 
and it, and it seems like the legal recourse is not well maybe you can speak about that uh, John what are the le- what is the legal recourse for someone who gets that phone call from their bank can they just tell them to kiss off you know I'm not an American or do they have to go through this process of proving that they are not an American or or maybe renounce a citizenship that they didn't even realize they have well they don't have to do anything at all uh, actually, uh, you know, so the bank calls and says, hey, you know, we know you were born in the U.S., you're a U.S. citizen, and, uh, you know, whatever, and the bank gives them some forms to fill out. They're not required by law, as far as I know, to fill out those forms or even respond, uh, and I suspect a lot don't. A lot do, but a lot probably don't, and, of course, if they don't, uh, the banks are going to send the existence of their accounts, you know, to the IRS. Yeah. Uh, well, but but banks, will close, banks will close or put their ca- accounts on hold yeah, if that's they what don't I'm, respond. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's where I say they have so little choice because if they don't follow the rules, and I put that in air quotes, and respond uh, the way the bank or the, the, the U.S. government thinks they should, now they have no banking uh, opportunities or the opportunities that they had are taken away. Um well, okay, then, then there are, I mean, you know, their options are basically as follows, all right, I suppose, in order. Uh, one, uh, you know, the bank wants the Social Security number. I suppose they could go out and try to get a Social Security number, all right? going to take a long time to do that. You know, that's definitely, uh, you know, it can take up to a year. They can do that, and they can then, you know, basically do nothing beyond that. Okay, so, in other words, they keep their account, right, keep their account, the bank sends their information to the IRS. I guess that's option number, well, you know, if they respond. Yeah. Uh, you know, that, that, that would be the first line of response. What happens from that point? I don't know. You know, I, I do think, though, it becomes a bigger problem in opening investment accounts, right, and things like that. I think right. the problem is less U.S. taxation than it is the opportunity cost uh, of not being able to open certain accounts. Two, exactly. what's the second option? Well, the FACA IGAs uh, give an option to self-certify uh, that they're not a U.S. citizen, even though they have a U.S. birthplace. And, you know, there's a process for that. And they may have con- committed some expatriating acts along the way. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, you know, certainly those who independently naturalize as a citizen of another country have a better opportunity to do that. And if this thing is written up in a certain way, what it means is the bank is satisfied its regulatory requirement. Uh, you're a you're um, you have a U.S. birthplace, okay, but you're not being reported to the IRS, okay. That's the second option. Uh, the third option would be to say, well, you know, the bank says if I have a CLN, a certificate of loss of nationality, that uh, I'm good to go. So you go out and get a certificate of loss of nationality, and you do that by making an appointment to renounce U.S. citizenship. Uh, now. Uh, just to, uh, clear, you know, uh, reinforce a point here uh, that's a legal point, all right, and uh, anybody who says anything to the contrary is 100% wrong. Yeah. Uh, there's absolutely no requirement of tax compliance to renounce U.S. citizenship. You know, they're completely different issues. One takes place under the, uh, you know, the Immigration Nationality Act, and, of course, the tax laws take place under... Uh, uh, you know, the Internal Revenue Code. So you can do that. You can go get a certificate of loss of nationality, you know, you give that back to the bank, all's good. You know, you can live your life as wherever you are, no problem at all. It does not, though, end any possible tax liability on the U.S. side. So the next thing you could do in conjunction with renunciation would be, um, you could say, well, you know, uh, I think what I'm going to do is I want to uh, clean up any tax problems, and there are varying ways to do that. I mean, uh, you know, I don't want to go into too much detail just yeah. because of time, but there are prescribed programs to do that that are irritating. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but you know, entirely possible. So you can do that. And my general, um, my general view of this, for what it's worth, is that... Uh, to the extent that these kinds of problems can be cleaned up easily at a relatively modest cost, it's probably not a bad idea because there's no way to know, you know, where things will be, you know, 10 years from now or something like that. Yeah. And the final option or a, or another option, maybe not the final option would be, I mean, let's not, 
uh, you know, be overly <laughs> negative on the issue of U.S. citizenship. It may be that there are some people who didn't even realize they were U.S. citizens and are thrilled, are thrilled to be U.S. citizens. Oh, my God, I woke up. I have another citizenship, and it's U.S. citizenship. Sure. And, and, uh, and they say, well, this is all good news. And, and then they say, well, now I'm going to make the decision whether as a U.S. citizen I enter the U.S. tax system, you know, which they're required to by law, or, you know, I delay it until I have more money or something like that. Yeah. But I think that actually... Um, you know, I think that for some people, this isn't actually an opportunity that they may never have considered. I mean, I know that most people are horrified by the whole thing, but yeah, there are yeah. people who think that U.S. citizenship may have value. Sure, sure. And you know, and for them, you know, it's it might be it might be welcome news, right? I it, mean, maybe they have relatives. It, 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 who knows? It may be, and there and there are options out there, um, which which leads me to the last uh, question or the last issue I'd like to 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 present to both of you. Uh, there are options out there, but those options are sometimes clouded because of the amount of misinformation there is out there when it comes to tax compliance for American citizens abroad. Um, John, if you would briefly, uh, as I say, there's a lot of misinformation out there, but then there's the truth <laughs> uh, about, this, about this whole thing uh, that has to do with citizen-based uh, taxation. Um, anything you want to say about that? Misconceptions versus the truth. Well, okay. First of all, uh, there is no better place in this world to hide evil than in a modern tax code. Oh. Okay? Uh, people don't even know evil, injustice, unfairness. Uh, people don't even know what's in the thing. And I think that everybody would agree that any country that defines tax residency based just on the place of birth in the country has got to have you know, some kind of moral deficiency, right, in their in their view of what tax residency is. One would think. Uh, but anyway, so, so that's what we're dealing with. It's an extremely complex system, and it can't be understood. And what people crave most under stress is, I think, certainty. Yes. Uh, and they're not going to be able to get that. So in an uncertain world, they can't really understand their situation. It's open season for you know, what I call the fear mongers, you know, on the internet, you know, to spread all these, you know, yeah. the penalties are horrific and blah, blah, blah. My Isn't experience with this is that it's a huge problem, but nobody's out looking for accidental Americans and nobody's, none of these people are getting penalties as far as I can see. All right. And so fear is not warranted here. Okay. I mean, I think that this is a situation where you respond Okay, you respond with calmness, deliberation, and you do not react with anger. Well, yeah. And you do not react I, in a way where, because you crave certainty so much, you feel that if you give all your money to the IRS, at least that's certain, and therefore it's a good <laughs> thing to do. Yeah. Right. You do not commit suicide to avoid dying, all right? Yes, it's a problem. <laughs> yes, you have tax responsibilities and liabilities, Okay, but nobody's being carted off to jail or being given massive penalties. Well, can I can I push back on that? And maybe Keith, you can jump in and, and, and have an answer here. But isn't it true that there are some people who are being rather heavily fined uh, when they're found to be non-compliant as an American citizen living overseas, non-compliant to the U.S. tax code? Keith. Well, uh, I'm sure there are. All I can say is from my experience over the past 12 years mm -hmm. that those who are, you know, those who are not in the U.S. tax system don't have a tax problem. But those who are <laughs> in the U.S. tax system are the ones who have a tax problem. I'm, I'm, I'm giggling. Course, I'm giggling. But but it's that it's 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 funny because it's so simple. When right, you lay it course, out like that, each, when you lay it li out like that, it, it makes sense, Keith. Yeah. And of course, each case must be weighted on its sure. own merits, Sure, you know, because everyone has their own a bit of nuances. But just generally speaking, yeah. you know, yeah. that's the case. Interesting. 
Well, yeah. I want to thank you guys. Uh, we put some good information out there, a little bit more concise this time, because we, we don't want to drown people in information. We want to give people the information that they need to be a little bit better educated about this subject. And I think you guys do a great job with, with the work that you do. I think you guys did a great job laying out some information here today. And I thank you both for coming on my program to do that. Thank you both so much. Thank you all for listening. Thank you all for watching. Remember, in the description of this episode, whether you're on, on, um, uh, I'll get it out. Uh, whether you're watching this on YouTube or listening to it on a podcast platform, you'll see in the description where you can click into several links to support the work I do. Most importantly, I would like you all to click on that link that goes to my audiobook subscription. I'm writing an audiobook. Uh, I am writing a book and I'm putting every chapter in audio format and releasing it weekly. So if you start subscribing to that, you'll start with chapter one and then next week you'll get chapter two and the week after that, so on and so forth. All the way through to the end. What's interesting about it is each chapter that I've written is unedited. I write the chapter and then I get on the microphone immediately and read it in and then deliver it out to you, the subscriber. So, there it is for you. Check out the episode description and click on that link. Subscribe to my audiobook. You won't regret it. I'm telling a great story. I'm at least having a lot of fun with it, and I'd love to share it with you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Subscribe on YouTube. Subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you're listening. Subscribe. It helps a lot. Help push this out there to people. Uh, share my work if you would, please. I really appreciate it. Take care, everybody. Bye now. <laughs>